what I intend to do is to, to spend uh, about a quarter of an hour talking about uh, the new declaration mainly, which is the document that sort of relaunched, as it were, the SDP. Um, I'll do that, f as I say, for about a quarter of an hour, and then I'll hand over to Patrick, who'll say a few words, uh, on, particularly on Brexit, I think. Um, uh, and then we'll do a long Q&A and a discussion, which I think will be useful. Um, so the Social Democratic Party, we're very proud of our origins, uh, which go back to uh, 1981, where I'm going to do uh, history of the SDP in 30 seconds, which I'm often asked to do. Um, so in 30 seconds, the, the, ga the gang of four, uh, four very prominent uh, Labour Party politicians established the SDP as a Labour Party offshoot, basically. And it has a unique position in British history, British political history, because it's, the, it's to date the single largest challenge uh, to break the two-party system. Still work in progress. We, need, we still need to, to do that. But it's, in history, it's, uh, it's, um, that's its, its claim to fame, I guess. Um, so the, the Gang of Four established the party in 81. David Owen, the then leader uh, in 1988, protected its independence in the merger with the Liberals in 88. Uh, the Liberal Democrats is the off offshoot of that merger. But Owen um, protected our independence, um, so we survived today uh, as, a, as an independent party. Reason, uh, social democracy is not liberalism. We can discuss that, but it's, it's entirely different. And actually, that conflict between those two things affects the Lib Dems to this day. Um, so Owen kept it alive. The grassroots members kept it going to this day. Membership it was kicked to the grassroots. Membership went down quite a quite low uh, point. Uh, and then a couple of years ago, it started growing again. It's very interesting that it started growing. Um, the uh, National Committee asked me to get a, a new um, philosophical document uh, produced, which is the New Declaration, uh, which we published uh, at the end of 2018. And it was very well received. It was uh, well received. It was praised by the likes of David Goodhart, Toby Young, Rod Little said it was fantastic. <laughs> uh, Giles Fraser uh, praised it and then joined us. Uh, and Sir Paul Marshall said it exceeded the, uh, the Limehouse Declaration, which is very kind of him. Uh, so what I want to do is just take, uh, go across the new declaration like a skimming stone, really, because uh, we're in a university, I'm going to try and concentrate on the ideas. Um, and I, I'm going to try and contrast uh, abstract ideas and I ideologies with uh, reality, I think, if, uh, in any case I can. So the first section uh, in the ND is independence. Um, and the quote is this. Free from vested interests, we represent neither capital nor labor, not private industry nor the public sector. And it might seem an obvious point, but actually vested interests are the fundamental basis of our political system in both parties. I mean, just think about it. The Labour Party's vested interest is the public sector, and in particular the public sector unions. And the uh, Conservative Party's vested interest is big business. So basically what big business wants, it gets. So to say that we have a, a sort of non-interest-based politics would be false. The question is, could we have one? Could we have a party that actually wants to govern for the whole of the country, not just uh, specific parts of it. And we think we could. Um, it's also worth um, reflecting also that the, a lot of the problems that we have are as a result, a direct result of the interest-based politics we have. So the oscillation, constant oscillation between Labour, which tends to overspend and run out of money, and then the Conservatives who perforce do a load of cuts. That's a, a product, basically, we think, of the vested interest basis of our politics. Yeah? So if you get rid of that, you might get rid of the oscillation. And those running things like the health service might actually benefit from some consistent spending. And actually, it's very interesting, the last election, which we've just, we've just finally recovered from, um, interesting looking at the programs. Corbyn's program had austerity written all over it, in my opinion. I know there's a lot of Labour people who we, we can discuss that. There was austerity written all over that program, just later. Um, second section in the New Declaration is, de is called Democracy. Uh, the key quote there is, we consider the nation state to be the upper limit of democracy. We regard it as indispensable to the solidarity of our society and concern for fellow citizens. And the point there is uh, really a point about not um, understanding that the nation has a place in terms of convening mutuality. That's the key point. Uh, and it's, it's necessary because if we want to do things together, 
we actually depend on that mutuality. We depend on that buy-in. And if you don't get the buy-in, you don't get the sharing. And if you don't get the sharing, you don't get things like the National Health Service. Key point. Uh, and since we're in university, uh, you'll be aware of the fact the sort of Rawlsian tendency to go for liberal legalism. You've probably just, you know, studied that to vouchsafe rights of various kinds or, or political uh, arrangements. Uh, and I would say that um, it, it, it might be a, an approach which coincides with proper politics, but proper politics is actually about winning political arguments for what we do, not relying on uh, legal legalism to justify what we get. So again, in relation to the health service, National Health Service is a political achievement and it's a cross-party political achievement, and that's why it survives. If, it were, if we relied on liberal legalism, we might be in a situation, say, that they have in the States, where you have no political consensus. Uh, they've never been able to win a political argument for universalism. So as a result, they don't have it. So I think the building blocks are political, not liberal legal. Um, Part of that sec uh, democracy section, we have a little kick at supranationalism. So we say supranationalism is a neoliberal ideology aimed at neutering domestic politics and placing the most important issues beyond the reach of ordinary voters. So the key thing is beyond the reach. Uh, and I know Patrick's going to speak about the EU, but I'm just going to have a little kick at it here. <laughs> what, what, it, what it does is it's structured to put social democracy beyond reach. If I were a normal Portuguese voter, I would not be able to vote in any politician directly to my parliament that had a direct impact on, on key matters like uh, immigration, trade policy, industrial policy, monetary policy, fiscal policy. All of those things are taken off the table and decide, decided at what you might say a pre-political level elsewhere. And it's key that we recognize that. And actually another, another, since we're talking about ideas, it's important to recognize that the EU can be, can take those things off the table and, and decide them pre-politically. It can't be social democratic, but it could be liberal. I mean, it could be liberal. You could have a liberal policy. The EU might represent liberalism, but it's not social democracy, key point. <clears throat> Next section is uh, nation and world. A uh, key quote there is, the progressive desire for people to shed their national identities and unite in a pan-European or universal civilization. We're criticizing that. Uh, I think that's a highly utopian idea, uh, which all evidence that we can see refutes. Uh, the Greek crisis is the, probably the best example of this, where when mutuality was called for, we found it wasn't there. Reason? Mutuality is built at national level. Uh, and you can't just click your fingers and expect German voters to, to buy in to, to I mean, the, the tragedy was that it resulted, the lack of mutuality across those states resulted in the crisis and, and uh, you know, um, pharmacies in, in Athens running short. But that wouldn't have happened at national level, that's the point I'm making, it wouldn't have happened. Uh, and again, it's because it's we're in the uh, university, think about it as ideas, universalism, it's a lovely idea, but it's an is-ought problem. Uh, and what is, uh, is different from what ought to be, possibly. Um, on immigration, part of the nation and world, we, we, we have a little kick at uh, what we describe as the naive ambitions of open border zealots. Again, <coughs> open borderism is, is very popular, particularly among young people, very popular, and you can, you can argue the point. And actually, I, I guess, open borders within limits, you know, because in, <laughs> in Europe, in the EU, it's a liberal project, so you want open borders, but, we, but they're not that open, are they? Uh, it is very, very uh, contextualized. But it, it's something which clashes with, um, with, with, again, something else I was talking about, the nation state. So what will be the price of genuine open borders globally? What will be the price to states like this? The price, I think, it would be to put certain <laughs> things at risk, in particular, things that are social. It's in our name, the social. So I, the things that it would put at risk would be social cohesion, the social wage, that concept that we, that we, that we have that, and it's, it's, we, there's no denying that we certainly have it, in which rich Western countries we have the social wage, the social contract, which is the deal that any citizen has for your, for your government to look after your interests. Well, open borders don't do that. And the welfare state itself. So I think those things 
uh, in reality, again, it's the difference between ideas in, uh, in, in theory uh, and reality. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to spend a bit of time on the next uh, section in the ND, which is the, the social market economy. Why? Because it's our, it's our policy, it's our flagship policy. It was introduced as an idea uh, into this country by this party. Its origins are in post-war German uh, politics. Uh, but it's the flagship policy. It's strangely uh, simple to explain and actually quite complex. But I'll try, I'll try the simple one first. Um, it's basically a simple idea. It's also, it's also a very... Um, it's, a, it's also a very subversive idea, actually, in the social market. Um, it's the idea that the, the state and the, and, and the market are not opponents. It's that simple. They're not opponents. They're different parts of the same society. And in particular, they rely on each other. They absolutely rely on each other. Uh, and again, it's a failing of both lib uh, labor and conservative thinking to, um, to privilege one of those sectors, uh, which is a mistake. Uh, so, key quote, uh, we believe that pro-public sector and pro-market policy can beneficially coexist within a balanced programme, provided that each inhabits its correct domain. And the t two concepts in social market thinking are frontiers and domains. So, domain, this bit, that bit, frontiers, what should the state do, what should the market do? Um, it, was, it was a point that Roy Jenkins made uh, we haven't mentioned Roy Jenkins a lot recently, have we? But uh, no. the, first, the first Social Democratic Party leader and uh, ex-EU uh, Commission president, uh, he, said, he said rightly uh, that setting one uh, sector against another was basically a false, false dichotomy. And he's right. If you look at it, I mean, I know the Labour Party has, can certainly contains Social Democrats that would probably agree with us on this. But it also contains a lot of people on the idealistic side, who constantly decry profit and profit making. You'll hear this a lot in rhetoric. Uh, very foolish. Uh, no profit, no surplus, no tax, no public sector. It really, it's that simple. Unless you have some sort of total command economy, you need profit, you need surplus, and you, you can't um, uh, decry it and then run a successful uh, modern economy. It's impossible. And likewise, on the conservative side, the sheer indifference to key parts of the public sector from successive conservative governments, bordering on neglect, I would say, in certain, ha you know, housing is the worst part. To think that the state has no active, significant role in building housing is an absurd idea. But it seems mm. to have taken, the conservatives have, have gone with this, and the consequences actually for your generation are, are shocking, you know, and, and, and I, I, I describe it as a breach of the social contract. It's that bad. But again, it's based on this uh, this partial view that both parties have. You know, Tories get in, forget about that those bits don't really matter. Um, so there we go. Finally, on, on social market, just to finish, uh, key quote, the state has wrongly ceded parts of its rightful domain to global capital and has lost confidence in its own capacity for direct provision and intervention. And again, this loss of confidence is, is striking. Um, and it's a paradox. When you, you know, I've, I knocked on four and a half thousand doors in the election, you speak to people about housing or uh, rail transport, and it's, it's the sheer exasperation that the public, a, a, a you know, a weak and inept state cannot serve its citizens. It's impossible. And, and people know this, people understand it. Um, and uh, it's a paradox because when Britain came out of the war in 45, Two, certainly at least two governments who went on to the 60s, but the Attlee government and the, um, and the Macmillan government were active in, in, in building council houses, did so on a vast scale, successfully, strong and active state. At the same time as the, uh, half of the cities had bomb sites, we had uh, austerity, we had food rationing, but the government still uh, convened the solidarity to do this and was a strong and active state. They actually had the belief to do it. And, and unfortunately, today, <coughs> the state seems to have lost faith or confidence, actually, I would say, in its capacity to do things. Not including HS2, which is a terrible idea. <laughs> um, before I get on to the final part, um, uh, there's a little small section on tolerance, uh, which is relevant. I've, I've, I've given you a preview of uh, uh, something which we're launching next month, which is the Charter of Academic Freedom. Free speech is a massive issue. Freedom of thought and inquiry, 
uh, freedom of expression are actually key values, key Western values, I would say, but human values as well. And I think we lose it, we, we protect them or lose those things. We've got to fight for free speech. And actually the idea of universities discouraging people to come along and chat, uh, it's ridiculous, absolutely ridiculous. No platforming, ridiculous. Uh, I think it's the core, the reason, apart from people being uh, bullies, I think, which is a problem, the reason people are no platforming is because they're ter terrified they're going to lose the arguments. In many cases, they would, actually. So have a read of it. We're, you've got a preview because it's not actually launched yet. Um, final five minutes. So the, 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 the concluding sections of this new declaration are all about, they sort of focus on, the, you know, I think most of you would be aware of the, uh, the, 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 the change from socioeconomic politics to sociocultural, something that happened in all, uh, all Western countries. Uh, and, and actually, you, could see, you can see it globally as well. Uh, so there's a, f a focus on cultural issues which wasn't there before. And um, I think, in a way, that's a good thing, because certainly in our party, we think that a lot of our problems are, are squarely cultural, actually. And again, I get a little bit exasperated, particularly when hearing Labour politicians hammer cuts, cuts, money, money, money. I mean, that's the flip side of, 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 of some Tory idea that the life, life's about money. It's not about money. It's not just about money. It's about many, many other things. It's about values. It's about trust, mutuality, uh, duty. It's actually about that and, and concern for others. A lot of our problems are, are cultural, actually. And I think to dress them up in second order economics is, is, a, is a mistake. Top tip, you know, if you want to win an argument, don't, don't do second order economics. EU referendum 20, 2016. They didn't have the confidence to go for, for heart, so they went mm -hmm. for second order, they lost. It's a very important uh, lesson. So what's our, our position as a party? I think we, we are, a, 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 I would say, a mainstream post-liberal position. So what we're looking at is, I think, if, if, if you get the diagnosis right, I think we've had the best part of 35 years of, of what I call double, double liberalism, uh, economic liberalism, of the market fundamentalists combined with a degree of social liberalism and in particular individualism at the same time. So that m most of our societies have been hammered by d double liberalism and we have a liberal attitude towards family life, to parenting, to gambling, drug taking. Uh, we're developing it to prostitution in Leeds. Uh, we have a liberal attitude towards c compulsory school sport, a liberal attitude towards uh, immigration and integration. And actually, again, top tip for the Labour Party, I don't think they would take this on. But, um, uh, you know, if you want to win some elections in the North East, and we, my, my region saw 10, 10 seats go to the Tories. Astonishing. It never happened in my lifetime. Never happened in my life. We usually have two or three. And the Tories can win elections on three or four. But to have 10, it's astonishing. Top tip, just if you want to win an election in the North East, um, have a look at immigration and, and be less enthusiastic about very high levels of immigration. We can be pro-immigration, we are pro-immigration, but we're not pro-mass immigration, and there's a very, very big difference. Less enthusiasm about that, and also more um, concern and less indifference about integration. Less indifference about mm -hmm. integration. Integration is very important. We've got to be one society somehow. Um, but it, when, I, when I describe it, liberal attitudes towards family life or gambling, or, you, know, I, you could strike out the word liberal and just replace it with the word indifferent. Because I think that's the problem. And, and what's crept up is you get a Tory attitude. It doesn't matter who runs our trains. It doesn't matter. Whatever, wh whoever wins the contract, get it. It doesn't matter. We don't convene national anything now. We just sell every, every, chop it up and, and, and sell it in little bits. And that, what that is, is a liberal attitude. It's indifferent. Most Tories are liberals, actually. There's not that many conservatives in the, in the Conservative Party. Uh, and it's a problem. And it, so I think we've, we've been overdosed on this. Uh, and just to finish, so you know, if, if, if that's the problem, then the, the solution is basically quite clear, which is just a less strident liberalism. So we're liberals, small, small L liberals, I guess, but we're, there's been an incredible, incredibly strident liberalism in the last 30 years. And it's just a case of, of having a, a sort of tilt away from that. Uh, so, and, and also the point is, has it made us happy? No, it hasn't. <coughs> so that's the solution. What we describe as a more social, communitarian approach to politics what many of us have called the red-blue type of politics, because we have com policy combinations which are people perceive as right and left on the same program. I think it works very, very well, depending on the, on the area. Uh, 
The real divide, I think, is between the social and the liberal. It's between the communitarian and the individualistic, and all of us have to decide whether it's about us or about me. So that's, mm. that's where we are. Thanks very much. <laughs>